idea of... Uh, here, here's something people don't realize. And it's, it's not too difficult to understand when you grasp the initial parts of it. You're dealing with a system with a, the, who plans the future always, and always did. Yeah. Uh, and how clever to write your ending as the beginning of your holy books. Yeah. We must remember that uh, there's a lot of hidden allegories in Genesis, for instance, to give you the realization they're giving you the ending, they're giving you it as the beginning, but it's actually been reversed. Their goal is to, to recreate Adam and Eve in the one perfection of a deity, which is a hermaphrodite. Hmm. And, and of course, if Adam was the perfect uh, image, imagio of, of the deity, it, it's a perfect sameness. That's what it is in the Greek, perfect sameness. Hmm. And yet, they took the female eventually from Adam. That meant that he had male and female within him. Yeah. That's the part of the mystery religion. And what do we find today? The scientists are trying to create hermaphroditic beings for the future, which will be well balanced, will obey, uh, there'll be no quarrels, no male, female anymore as such, and they can just clone more and more of them rather than have births for them. Yeah. This is all part of stuff that's been written down by high scientific groups. And um, now let's go back again even to the same technique of putting the ending at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Plato had been, he, he'd studied in Egypt for years, that's where he got his education. Yeah. He then, once he got into the high degrees, he did a circular tour, they still do this today. And he went to, to uh, what's now called the Holy Land area to be initiated into other degrees, and then he went to India. Yeah. <laughs> for, for, so this is the same thing, India has a big player in all of this, always has been, very quiet place, but a lot goes on there. <laughs> and Plato being a member of the mystery religion, knew this technique of giving you uh, something that happened in the past as a story, but for the initiates, he's telling you what their ultimate goal was going to be hmm. by giving you a story as though it happened in the past. Interesting. Very interesting. And, and yeah. even the name he gave for for the, the, the predecessor and his family, he claims, and even hmm. that's tongue-in-cheek, we don't know if he was pretending or what, hmm. but he said his name was Solon, so his soul is, is the sun. Yeah. And the Greek city, when they went into Egypt and dominated Egypt, the main city was Heliopolis, or On, in um, Egyptian. Yeah. So it was the son of On. <laughs> and, uh, and so there's, there's tongue-in-cheek allegory uh, and a story form for something which is to come. Yeah, it's a, and it's a, it's it's a loop of of history and mythology all mixed up, I guess, and they can, you know, tie in the knots where they feel necessary to kind of keep the same game going over, you know, millennia, I guess. And all we have, by any other author, is on Atlantis, is the same little sketchy piece, where they mention uh, that the Atlanteans were at war with with the, the Greek colonies. Mm -hmm. And they were overrunning them, and it was the Spartans who saved them. Yeah. They defeated the Atlanteans, and as it was ending, then Atlantis sank. Mm, yeah. We don't have any real stories except the ones that were invented in the 1700s, 1800s mm. by Masons to talk about higher technologies. That's when they put all these books out that were that had nothing to back them up. Mm. But the more they're repeated, the more it seems true. You see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, mm. Because that's all we have on, on Atlantis. Mm. And we do know that, that if you go into the Mediterranean, the Aegean Sea, um, you'll find uh, that they've excavated, tremendous excavate, excavations on the island of Terra, which is part of a, a, a ring of islands. Mm. And at one time, those, those, that they, were, they were the outer ring of an island that did sink. We know that is true. Yeah. We do know that, that the people who lived there lived, they were high merchants, they owned the ancient world's merchant routes, and uh, every room has hand-painted frescoes, ideal location, beautiful temperatures. They lived, they were the high-class peoples of their day. We know that the middle of the island sunk, it was a volcano, and they did get off. Most of them did manage to abandon it, plenty of warning that was happening. 
Hmm. And that seems to be the, the, where the story of Atlantis really came from. Um, and if we are to take the again the the, <clears throat> the mirror loop kind of idea about history and mythology, the the destruction of Atlantis obviously again then is going to be mirrored in the destruction of America if that is yes. the new Atlantis. That's right. Um, and in one sense, I don't know if, if this is the case, if we, if we can tie this in, but uh, since we began to talk about uh, communism, communism and, and socialism, the I, I guess there is a c- kind of a current, you know, um, ongoing invasion from you know South America into North America to kind of merge the whole continent and all of that. Yeah. But wasn't this um, okay? This might not have been Karl Marx who wrote this, but wasn't this one of the ideas that was brought forth by Karl Marx um, to kind of yeah, get... Yeah, he wrote that in Das Kapital. Ah, uh, yeah. And he, he, he said that a world would evolve uh, if they worked hard enough towards it, where they would have a united Europe, yeah, a united Americas, and a, a, a far eastern conglomerate. It's now called the Pacific Rim region. Mm, yeah. Uh, so this was all worked out by the economists of the day, um, the big players like John Stuart Mill and others were all heavily involved in the planning of this. Uh, the bankers, uh, Rothschilds, were heavily involved in it too. Mm-hmm. It was foreign policy, in fact, to them. And then they, they simply... What they do, you see, they have different special groups of high Freemasons. Yeah. Just like the monks. See, Freemasonry already existed within certain groups of monks down through the ages. And if you wanted to start your own order of monks, you'd have to get a charter either from the group you were already in mm-hmm. or from the Vatican. You know? mm-hmm. uh-huh. And so what they, what they did was that they, you'd have ones who dealt with healing. Now, if you were into the translation of ancient languages, you would start your own up and have a charter to do it. And then that order would, would specialize in ancient languages. Well, that's the same way it still works today. Hmm. within free, high Freemasonry. Yeah. And so they give you the order called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and the American branch is called the Council on Foreign Relations. Hmm. Uh, they're still, they, they still don't publish, mainly, uh, the, the meetings to the public. Yeah. And I've got a videotape where this guy's introducing Brzezinski, and he says that, he says, this is one of the few public, uh, um, um, publicly available broadcasts we're giving out Generally, it says we don't allow the public to, to hear our meetings. Yeah. <laughs> so here, then you find every politician who's worth his salt is a member. Every high journalist is a member. Every newspaper man's a member. Yeah. Every high guy in the military is a member. It's the whole system. Yeah. They're part of a secret society that claims it is non-governmental. And they don't play politics. That is true. They make an agenda, and they follow that agenda. Yeah. They don't play politics. So we, that's a specialized branch of higher masonry. Um, I mean, the same thing as precursor was the group that Cecil Rhodes and Rothschild set, set up in Britain, mm-hmm. um, which became the round table, table group of Lord Milner, Alfred Milner. Mm-hmm. Uh, that merged with the Cecil Rhodes Society, and they became the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and they were given a British Crown Charter to exist, like a license. Yeah, and they had this. So in, a, in, a, in a sense, working for the British government. Yeah, uh, R- uh, Rhodes uh, people who got Rhodes uh, scholarships, right? Like Clinton. Yes, and, and now, of course, many politicians and bureaucrats of all countries uh, are Rhodes scholars. They all go to Oxford for their training, yeah. get sent back to their own countries, but they're already sworn towards working selflessly towards world government. Yeah, H- how would you tie in? Uh, people like Hugo Chavez in all of this. Uh, any ideas on him? Well, you almost always have your, your, your oppositions, what appears to be oppositions. Mm-hmm. The public uh, who are living in the bottom level of the matrix, uh, uh, they can clue in when they see a common enemy. One enemy. The bit is getting too big for their boots. Yeah. So the trick has always been the dialectic. You always give an opposition to the enemy knowing the public then will, will take sides. Because in the, in the mystical arts, you always need at least two sides to create conflict, and out of conflict you guide the change. Yeah. The synthesis. 
and, and that's how it, this has been done for thousands of years. In ancient times, they couched it in more mystical language, and, and they would say that, that uh, summer combats winter, uh, spring combats autumn. Mm. And so that, because that had to be even more secret from, from the powers that ruled at that time. Today, mm. they're more open about the technique, and probably Marxism came out more openly than any other group by putting this technique down of, of the eternal struggle, eternal conflict to the ultimate goal. Yeah. And <laughs> you see, once in communism, you start off with, with your, your, your thesis, and, and that's, that could be your, your front group causing pressure, mm-hmm. knowing that, that for every act, uh, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. So you, you, you then create the, the reaction to it, <laughs> and you put your men in there for, lead, for leaders. Yeah. And then you have a synthesis, but it doesn't stop there with the synthesis, which is compromise. You've now changed the system to a compromise. Then you take the synthesis, and you start, that, that then becomes the new thesis, and then it has its, its antithesis, and then it becomes a, a synthesis again. It has to be never-ending until they reach their final goal of creating man as God. Yeah. For men, basically. Yeah. All going back to Charles Darwin, again. <laughs> and Darwin, all he was doing uh, was, was vocalizing his Masonic religion, because the Masonic religion had always believed in evolution. Yeah. And that with the use of science and understanding nature, they could speed the process up. Um, we had um, one uh, one uh, question f- for you, Alan, regarding you know, and I and I guess we could tie all of this together again in, in with the in with the the current situation in in um, in North and South America or America at large regarding um, multiculturalism and and how this is you know kind of being used. Do, do you think that this is ultimately is something you know damaging or, or i mean is this also one of these things that are being played out to to you know further advance the agenda oh there's no doubt uh rockefeller gave a speech and i have the video of it it was taken internally at one of his meetings with his group of the cfr mm-hmm. and right there he's, he's, they're talking about this and he says uh It'll be unfortunate, he said. He said, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. Yeah. <laughs> and then he said, unfortunately, this generation are, are the cannon fodder for, for the plan. Yeah. In other words, they, don't, they know that the, the chaos that will ensue as people battle to try and retain their cultures and the animosity and hatred they will build up. But they will use all of that as a reason for coming down hard on everybody into a totally planned, directed uh, society. Yeah. But they will use that. So they're intensifying it, in fact. And you, you actually find that some of the groups that are coming up from Mexico and have been taught to be really radically uh, pure Mexican in Mexico forever yeah. and, and reclaim their old territories are being funded by the same Rockefeller foundations and Carnegie and Ford foundations. Yeah. To be so. So... These foundations, uh, like Adam Weishaupt said, uh, since they have unlimited financing, will control all conflicts by financing all sides. Yeah. So I mean, it, that exactly. Yeah, and, and so again, this is into to bring in even more control. And 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 uh, I know you wanted to elaborate a little bit further. We we spent another show previously talking about the microchip, but uh, again, you have some new stuff on this. I, I mean, this is. Um, being, I mean, implemented, I guess, uh, as we speak, or, or what's what's your... Uh, well, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you how it's implemented. I mean, at Loyola University, where they, they've had the world meetings mm. of science uh, sponsored by the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, I, I have all of that material. 600 pages came out of that meeting. <laughs> And they say they have the chip ready to go. All they have to do is convince the public of the necessity of taking it. <laughs> And, and um, interestingly enough, I was watching a professor at uh, a university in Canada here mm-hmm. give a talk on the behavioral sciences, and he's a, a, he's a complete Huxley, and this guy believes in the, the writings of Huxley. Mm-hmm. And he was going on about um, the techniques of 